recording it for me, brilliant. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone to what is the first Connex webinar. Um, for, the, for those of you that are actually new to, to Connex, um, Connex stands for the Collaborative Network of X-ray Spectroscopy. And it's funded by um, one of the UK funders, the uh, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. And the, the idea of this, this network is to increase collaboration between experiment and theory in the area of X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, I think especially, you know, especially with you know, sources like diamond light source um, and, uh, and new techniques, there's, there's really uh, some exciting <coughs> science that can be done um, on, uh, on both model systems and then real like operating batteries or catalysts. Um, and, um, uh, but the data that we get out is often very complicated. And so we really need the synergy between experiment and theory to advance the, what we can extract from this uh, from this data, and then also, you know, for from the experimental perspective, guide the theory to what theories we we need to develop to to help support and analyze. Um, so, as part of this registration, if you um, we we do have a monthly newsletter. Um, uh, in, in, in March, we also have a summer school and a, a conference. So unfortunately for this year's summer school, the, uh, the registration is now closed, but the, the conference um, uh, is still open. So if you want to take part in that, then, uh, uh, then more details will follow um, either looking on the website. So you can look at uh, the best way is just to type in Connex Newcastle and you'll find the website in Google. Um, uh, other than that, the, all the information will also come via via the uh, the, the newsletter, which is uh, which is bi monthly. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is the first webinar. We have another one next month, which is focused on the theory of X-ray spectroscopy and the developments on that. We then the following month in March, we won't have one because we've got the workshop and the summer school, and then the month after that. We have Peter Glatzel talking about uh, resonant X-ray spectroscopies, X-ray emission in elastic scattering. Um, but today it's a real pleasure to have Georg Held from Diamond Light Source in the University of Reading. And uh, Georg is really an expert in, uh, in, in X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and has done a, a lot of work in, in catalysis and um, looking at the, the, the arrangement and the, the properties of molecules that are attached to surfaces. And, uh, and a, He's going to give us an introductory lecture on, on X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and, and all the key things that we, we maybe should know but have forgotten or, uh, or don't know. So, uh, uh, yeah, um, it's a great pleasure. And, uh, yeah, uh, oh, it's a, one thing I should say in terms of questions, if you have a question, then just feel free to, uh, to type it in the chat, either in the public chat or send a private chat message to me or uh, Sophia Diaz-Moreno, who's the co-investigator on this grant and uh, and we can ask that at the end alternatively you can turn your camera on and mic on at the end of the talk and uh, and ask the question okay so with that Georg I hand over to you and uh, look forward to the talk okay thank you Tom yeah it's it's a great honor for me to be the first speaker in this uh, uh, series and my brief was to give um, introductory lecture uh, so I won't I, I, I will concentrate on, on the basics of XPS and instrumentation uh, characteristics of XPS spectra and then very importantly chemical shifts and then move on to synchrotron experiments. But I'm really concentrating on trying to explain the, the, the basic principles of XPS rather than to overwhelm you with data, which will still happen at, towards the end of my talk, I guess. Anyway, uh, let's start with the real <clears throat> basics. So that's the excitation of electrons with photons. And all of XPS is based on the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect was discovered uh, 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 almost 100, yeah, 133 years ago by Heinrich Hertz and Wilhelm Halbergs pretty much at the same time. Um, what they did was they exposed um, metal plate to UV radiation and they discovered that it charges, charges positively, that means it uh, emits electrons. And uh, they also discovered that there is a threshold frequency, a minimum energy that's required for that process to take place. 
Now, it took another 20 years almost, and a genius like Albert Einstein to explain that finding. And what Einstein discovered, and which is obviously common knowledge now, is that photons can only transfer their energy in packages of uh, H nu, H being the uh, Planck's constant, nu the frequency of the light. And for this, uh, Einstein received the Nobel Prize because it was really the foundation of quantum mechanics. Uh, interestingly, he never received the Nobel Prize for the, the theory of relativity. This was uh, what he uh, was the Nobel Prize awarded for, actually. Okay, to understand that, um, we best uh, use a diagram like this. So uh, we have a, a, a vertical a, a vertical dimension that gives us the energy and we have the different energy levels that are involved. So we have a, a bound electron uh, at a binding energy EB away from the Fermi energy. The Fermi energy is the highest occupied level in a, in a metal. And the Fermi, G, Fermi energy is uh, separated by the vacuum level above which we can have free electrons by uh, phi uh, the so-called work function. Now the electron interacts with a photon that has an energy H nu, so that is represented by this uh, line here in our diagram. And when the energy is transferred onto the electron, the, uh, the electron is then elevated in this energy diagram up to this point here. So that makes it easy to calculate the kinetic energy of the electron. It is uh, the photon energy minus the binding energy that takes us to the Fermi level minus the work function that takes us to the vacuum level and all the energy that's left above the vacuum level, that's the kinetic energy of the electron. So the kinetic energy is photon energy minus binding energy minus work function. It depends on the binding energy and the photon energy. Uh, the work function is usually a constant um, uh, typically around five electron volts, so relatively small compared to the other energies involved, because we are talking about X-ray uh, energies, so uh, many hundred electron volts, um, uh, photon energies, and we are normally in XPS talking about core levels, so again, uh, several hundred uh, typically uh, of electron volts uh, of binding energy. Now, the photoelectric effect is very intimately connected to another effect of electron emission, and that's the so-called Auger effect. It was actually discovered by Lise Meitner a year before uh, Pierre Auger, but still uh, 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 it is named after Pierre Auger. It should, strictly speaking, probably be called the meitner Auger effect. Um, now, what they discovered was that uh, in parallel to uh, photo emission, atoms can also emit electrons of characteristic kinetic energy um, that do not depend on the source of ir irradiation. Uh, and that happens whether atoms are irradiated with electrons or X-rays. Now, what they found was these um, OJ electrons are secondary electrons, and they are emitted in the process of filling the core hole. So filling that um, uh, missing electron uh, or that electron level from which the photoelectron has been emitted. In order to explain it, we need three uh, um, uh, electronic levels in the atom. And so it can be understood as a two-step process. In the first step, uh, an electron from a level above, so an electron with a lower binding energy is used to fill the initial core hole. And that releases an energy EB3, that's the core hole energy minus EB2, that's the energy of the electron that's used to fill the core hole. Now this energy is then transferred onto a second electron, binding energy EB1. And 
we can now apply pretty much the same uh, uh, logic that we use to derive the kinetic energy of the photoelectron. So that's the energy available, EB3 minus EB2. Um, and the kinetic energy is this energy minus the binding energy of the second electron minus the work function. Now, very important in this formula, there is no photon energy. It's only energy levels of the atom. So the OJ electrons have a, kinet a, a characteristic kinetic energy, but don't depend on the photon energy. For the nomenclature of, of uh, OJ electrons, we use the three levels. We use the Roman letters for each of the three levels involved. So we would have, if, if the uh, uh, bottom level is from a K shell and the upper two are from L shells, that would be a KLL OJ electron or KLM and, and so on. Subscripts are used to indicate subshells. And it's important to uh, realize that this is the dominant mechanism of filling cohorts for low sat atoms. And by low sat, I mean below uh, set numbers of around 30. Um, if two um, uh, of these electrons are from within the same shell, we talk about a cost chronic OSHA transition, which um, means there is a large overlap of electronic states and therefore high probability for that to happen. And super cross chronic means that all three electronic levels are in the same uh, shell. That can only happen for higher shells, N and O shells, for instance. It's also important to remember that uh, the OSHA effect uh, leaves behind a double ionized atom. So the binding energies are slightly different from the binding energies that we determine in XPS, but still very similar. So we can use them to estimate uh, binding energies of OSHA electrons. Okay, that leaves us with two types of electrons in an electron energy spectrum. We have photoelectrons whose Kinetic energy depends on the photon energy, and we have OJ electrons whose kinetic energy do not depend on um, a, the photon energy. And in, in this spectrum here, we have an OJ KLL, uh, an oxygen uh, KLL OJ electron, and we have oxygen, carbon, and aluminum uh, uh, photoelectrons. I'll come back to that spectrum in a moment again. So um, in order to record these spectrums, like the one I've, I've just shown, we need uh, the right instrumentation. And the development of this instrumentation is closely related to one name, that of Kai Siegburn, who received the Nobel Prize for uh, his developments in 1981. Uh, he really made XPS uh, a usable method for uh, chemical analysis of uh, sample surfaces in particular. <clears throat> okay, so what do we need? Um, we want to use photo emission to identify and quantify sample composition. And we can identify which elements we have in the sample by uh, determining the binding energy of an electron. The binding energy is characteristic for a particular element. So in order to do that, we need to know the photon energy and we need to measure the kinetic energy. And as I said before, the work function is uh, usually a small energy contribution and we just need to make sure that is it is constant and it is known. Okay, so we need a monochromatic uh, uh, photon source of photon energies typically higher than 100 EV because only core electrons with energies typically 100 EV and above, maybe slightly below 70, 80 EV, but uh, 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 only those electrons are uh, characteristic for uh, the elements they come from. Valence electrons are not. 
And we can get those photons either from X-ray anodes with uh, a well-defined anode material, typically aluminum or magnesium for, for XPS, which emit a line spectrum. So we have a spectrum with one dominant line there, or we can use synchrotrons, purpose-built uh, particle accelerators, which have a wide emission spectrum that uh, extends all the way into uh, the hard X-ray uh, regime. Uh, but then we need to use monochromators to extract the uh, photon energy that we want. And then uh, the second component is an analyzer. We need to measure the intensity of the emitted electrons as a function of kinetic energy. And for that, we uh, use a hemispherical analyzer. Uh, uh, and the kinetic energy that we measure of the emitted electron is then the uh, directly re related to the binding energy of this electron. OK. Um, the X-ray anode, very simple principle. We have a hot filament, uh, accelerate electrons onto an anode. Uh, we typically apply voltages of 10 kilovolt or higher. The electrons then uh, cause uh, uh, core electrons to be uh, uh, emitted from the anode. And the core hole is then filled with other electrons and that uh, leads to X-ray fluorescence, um, whereby the energy of the emitted X-rays depends on the anode material. The next slide uh, shows um, spectrum of an aluminum anode irradiated with electrons of 15 uh, kilo electron volts. We see a very sharp, uh, um, a feature here, the uh, um, K alpha line of aluminum. It's actually a double line. It consists of two lines with um, a, a, a slightly different energies, 1486.7 and 1486.3 electron volts with a natural line width of uh, 0.85 electron volts. Um, other common X-ray um, uh, uh, anode materials are magnesium, uh, slightly lower silver, uh, slightly higher, or copper uh, that is already in the hard, hard X-ray uh, regime. Typical photon fluxes for um, uh, X-ray anodes are the order of 10 to the power of 9 to 10 to the power 11 photons. They are not very focused, so it's, it's, it's a relatively wide area they illuminate. Uh, the natural line width limits the energy resolution of, of our um, uh, experiment, but it can be reduced. We can have narrower line width if we use a monochromators in front of um, the uh, X-ray anode. The alternative is uh, synchrotron radiation. Synchrotron radiation was discovered in the 1940s. Um, and it is radiation that's emitted when electrons are forced on a circular track by a, a strong magnet. Uh, this is one of the first uh, 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 photographs of, of synchrotron radiation. So that's a big magnet here. The dimension is, uh, is about a, a meter in diameter. And then inside, we have a vacuum vessel where electrons are forced on a, on a circular trajectory. There's a window where we can see visible synchrotron radiation emitted. Since the 1970s, these devices have become a lot bigger. Down here, we have a diamond light source, which has a circumference of about uh, 500 meters. Um, the um, uh, purpose-built synchrotron facility, facilities um, built since the 1970s have multiple bending magnets and insertion devices that um, uh, amplify uh, synchrotron radiation. And um, we have 
at least from a single ma uh, magnet, we get a wide spectrum that is determined by the energy of the electrons. Uh, typical synchrotrons today have uh, electron energies upwards of one giga electron volt. Diamond has uh, uh, three giga electron volts. Um, and the uh, energy spectrum of diamond ranges from the uh, near infrared all the way up to uh, almost 100 kilo electron volts. So um, synchrotron radiation is um, characterized by the following uh, um, um, uh, specifications. Uh, it has high brightness, uh, that means high photon flux on a small spot, typically 10 to the power of 10 to the uh, 10 to the power of 14 photos per second on a spot of typically 100 by 100 uh, micron square. This is orders of many orders of magnitude higher than conventional X-ray tubes would deliver. We have high collimation, so the uh, radiation is emitted in a small angular range, uh, typically less than a tenth of a degree. We can tune the polarization of the light, which is useful for, for uh, some experiments. Um, more importantly for XPS, we have a tunability over a wide energy range by using monochromators. And for XPS, that's typically the energy range from a few hundred electron volt up to a few thousand. Also sometimes useful is its pulsed light emission uh, because the electrons uh, are not uh, circulating as a stream of electrons. They are uh, bunched into bunches of about a, a million electrons each. And every time they pass uh, a magnet, they will emit a flash of synchrotron light. So it's, uh, and, and that time structure can be used for time resolved experiments. Okay, so the synchrotron emits the light and then we need to monochromatize it. Uh, this is uh, at, uh, for soft x-rays done with uh, diffraction gratings, uh, line spacing typically around a micron. And that gives us energy resolutions of less than a tenth of an electron volt. So uh, again, almost an order of magnitude smaller than uh, 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 the natural line width of, of x-ray anodes. Uh, on a spot of um, uh, about 100 microns. But that, again, is flexible. Um, many synchrotron beamlines have much smaller spots if that's required. Um, just uh, a, a quick comparison between um, uh, the different ways of, of uh, getting X-rays. Um, so uh, most importantly, X-ray anode has a line spectrum Synchrotron has a continuous spectrum and we need to use um, uh, monochromators. The energy range for X-ray anodes starts from a, around about a thousand and can go up to um, the 100,000 EV range. Uh, the same is true for, for uh, synchrotrons, but we can go lower uh, in energy down to uh, yeah, really zero to the uh, near infrared, uh, as I said before. Typical flux as photons per second, it's medium for X-ray anodes, um, uh, higher for, for uh, synchrotrons. And then we have uh, unpolarized uh, light from the X-ray anode and polarized light from the synchrotron. So how do we detect the electrons? And more importantly, how do we measure their energy? For that, we use the hemispherical electron energy analyzer that was uh, pretty much invented by Siegmann in, Siegmann in the 1950s. Very simple principle, it consists of two hemispheres. The inner one is uh, on a positive potential, so it attracts electrons. The outer one on a negative potential, so it repels electrons. 
Um, there are two forces that act on the electron, essentially a future force, which basically drives the electron away from the center of this hemisphere, and the electrostatic force, which pulls the electron towards the center. Now for fast electrons, the uh, essentially future force will be uh, dom dominant and the electrons will just hit the outer hemisphere. For slow electrons, the electrostatic force will dominate and the electrons will hit the inner hemisphere. But there will be a, a energy, the so-called pulse energy for which um, the centrifugal force and the century, uh, uh, and the electrostatic force just compensate each other. And then the electron can actually make it to the other end of the detector, uh, of the uh, hemisphere and be detected by the detector. This is the pulse energy and it's, uh, it's um, determined by the, the radius, typically 100 to 200 millimeters. And the voltage is applied here. So this allows us to uh, uh, measure the kinetic energy of the electrons and measure spectra of kinetic energies. Um, modern uh, analyzers uh, consist of these hemispheres and they have an electrostatic lens in front of it. The electrostatic lens actually also uh, acts as a retarding field, so we don't actually change the, uh, the potentials on the hemisphere, we always use the same pass energy, but we uh, reduce the energy of the incoming electrons by applying a voltage between or across this lens. And this way we can uh, very conveniently scan the kinetic energy range. Okay, so with this setup, we have a well-defined photon energy, and we have a means of measuring the uh, intensity of uh, photo uh, electrons as a function of their kinetic energy. So we get a spectrum like this one here. And as I said before already, the big caveat is when you analyze the spectrum, we have both photoelectrons, which depend on the photon energy and OG electrons which do not depend on the photon energy. Now, if you have a way of changing the photon energy, it's easy to discriminate between them. You just change the photon energy. Osha electrons won't change the, the kinetic energy. Photoelectrons will. Now, we are measuring kinetic energies. And uh, uh, conventionally, the kinetic energy is, is plotted from left to right. Uh, but what we're interested in is the binding energy because that tells us what element we're dealing with. So therefore the binding energy is plotted from right to left because the binding energy um, is, um, yeah, if we convert this formula is H nu minus the kinetic energy minus the work function. Okay, so um, when we, look at these uh, peaks and start analyzing those peaks, um, we uh, have to remember that the, the excitation cross-section for a photoelectron depends on the binding energy, the number of electrons in the excited level, the photon energy, but it depends not, or at least not very much, on the chemical state of the atom. And that means the peak area underneath those uh, 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 photo emission peaks is proportional to the number of atoms um, in, in the surface, at least when, when attenuation can be ignored. I will come back to attenuation in a moment. Um, there are, and this is, this is the, one of the, the big applications of XPS, we can do a quantitative uh, elemental analysis based on uh, peak areas in XPS. There are a number of final state effects uh, that we need to consider when we interpret 
spectra. And these are related to um, the state of the atom after photoionization. Among them, uh, spin orbit coupling, lifetime broadening, and satellites. And I will go through these uh, now. So a spin orbit coupling is an interaction of the, the spin of the excited, the missing electron that combines with the angular momentum of the orbital uh, to uh, a total angular momentum of J equal L minus one half, L being the orbital quantum number or L plus one half. So remember we are exciting core um, uh, levels. They usually have a, 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 an overall spin of zero, but if we uh, remove an electron from there, we will have a spin of one half, a remaining spin of one half in that um, orbital. So the nomenclature for uh, these spin orbit coupled states is uh, the main quantum number. We now use the number, the uh, uh, angular momentum quantum number. So S, P, uh, D and so on. And then the J state, one half or three half for P levels and so on. Uh, there are always two peaks observed. Um, one half and three half for uh, p orbitals, three half and five half for d orbitals and so on. Uh, the higher j uh, state has the uh, lower binding energy and the lower j state, the higher binding energy. Um, the energy difference between those two increases with increasing binding energy and decreases with increasing L numbers. We also observe uh, similar effects uh, when uh, core electrons interact uh, with unpaired uh, electron, valence electron spins. Uh, so in that case, we can even have split S levels. Now, the multiplicity of uh, these J states is uh, uh, 2J plus 1. Um, so the intensity ratio between the L plus one half and the L minus one half state is therefore two L plus two divided by two L or L plus one divided by L. So the L plus one half state is uh, more intense and it is at the lower binding energy and the L minus one half is uh, less intense. Uh, the L plus one is uh, typically also narrower. There's an example here of um, a spectrum of a platinum sample, the, the red line uh, in this spectrum here. So here we have the split platinum 4F state, so the 7 half and the 5 half state. Here's the 4D, uh, 5 half and 3 half, uh, 4P, 3 half and, and 1 half, and the 4S is not split because uh, uh, the um, angular momentum uh, uh, quantum number is, is zero here. Um, the other important uh, final state effect is lifetime broadening. So that has to do with the lifetime of the uh, uh, core hole that uh, is left behind after photo emission. Um, this is filled by secondary processes like um, OSHA or X-ray emission. And it's due to the uh, uh, fact that the outgoing electron has a memory or actually knows about the lifetime of the core hole that uh, it leaves behind. And these two, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, sorry, the lifetime uh, and the uh, energy uncertainty of uh, the emitted electron is related through Heisenberg's relationship. So tor, the lifetime times delta E, the, the energy broadening is uh, Planck's constant divided by two pi. So that means um, 
lifetime of one femtosecond leads to an energy broadening of 0.6 electron volts. Um, for uh, carbon 1s and oxygen 1s levels that uh, uh, the lifetimes are eight femtoseconds and four femtoseconds um, respectively. So that leads to energy broadening of 80 milli electron volts and 160 milli electron volts, which is not very visible in XPS spectra because that's pretty much at the level of uh, instrumental broadening, but it can be uh, far more um, uh, serious when um, costochronic processes, remember those are fast, uh, highly probable um, OSHA decays are involved. Uh, in that case, uh, we can have very short lifetimes and that is again visible in the platinum spectrum that I showed a moment ago. So uh, the platinum 4F have very long lifetimes, no cost chronic transitions are possible. Um, and therefore we have a, a, a narrow uh, um, lines here. The LS splitting is also small because it's a high L uh, quantum number and the low binding energy. That's different for the platinum 5P, for instance. Here we have low L, low binding energy and super cost uh, 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 transitions possible. So the binding, uh, the um, broadening of the binding energy is um, as big as four electron volts. Whereas here for platinum, we have uh, the uh, platinum 4F, we have two uh, peaks essentially, the peak width essentially determined by the instrumental resolution, it's uh, less than one um, electron volt or of the order of one electron volt. Um, the final, uh, final state effect that I want to discuss is uh, um, inelastic um, uh, background. So um, photons on their way out interact with uh, other electrons and lose energy. That leaves a continuous tail of secondary electrons with lower kinetic energy by, behind each peak after, uh, 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 and the height of this tail is proportional to the height of the photo emission peak. And for quantitative analysis, that needs to be included. Um, we also have discrete excitations uh, for instance, when um, um, electrons are excited into unoccupied states, that in molecules and and uh, uh, mole in, in semiconductors that can lead to a narrow satellite peaks or asymmetric broadening of the main line in metals. Um, when electron emission is involved, then we have a broad satellite peak, so that would be referred to a shake off, whereas the uh, previous one, the excitone, would be often re referred to as a shake up satellite. And finally, we have plasmons, so that's a collective excitation of all electrons, and plasmons manifest themselves as a series of narrow satellite peaks with the same energy separa separation of about. 10 EV. So I just come back to the spectrum that I've shown before already. Uh, here, after the aluminium one, uh, 2P and the aluminium 2S uh, photo emission peaks, we have a series of satellite peaks, and that's typical for plasmon excitation in the aluminium metal. We also have this uh, tail of background after each of those two peaks. This is the inelastic background. And then after the uh, oxygen 1s uh, peak here, we have the characteristic satellite peak, which is due to uh, shake off. So the emission of a secondary electron um, um, uh, accompanying the uh, uh, photo emission of uh, the oxygen 1s. Okay, 
So um, one of the great uh, advantages of XPS is that it not only allows us to identify elements, so like in, in the spectrum before, we've seen oxygen 1s, we've seen carbon 1s, we've seen aluminum 2s and 2p, that means we can uh, determine that there is aluminum, oxygen and carbon in the sample. It also allows us uh, some conclusions about uh, the um, bonding of those elements, of those atoms within the sample. The binding energy of core electrons um, depends to some extent on the number and distribution of the valence electrons surrounding it. If we have valence electrons close by, they add to repulsive interaction and therefore will normally uh, reduce the binding energy. But this is a combination of initial and final states. Uh, so initial state before ionization that has to do with the valence uh, electron density, but there's also uh, final state effects uh, that has to do with the, the way how the valence electrons and the other core electrons within the atom react to the missing electron after the photo ionization has taken place. The rule of thumb is that a higher valence electron density leads to a lower binding energy. And this is particularly apparent uh, when we look at uh, elements with different oxidation states. So oxidation leads to a higher binding energy of the core electrons in the cation because we have fewer valence electrons. It's a, it's a positively charged ion, um, which lead to less repulsion between the valence electrons and the core electrons. And therefore we get a higher binding energy compared to the reduced element. Typically we see um, a shift in binding energy of about one electron volt per oxidation state. Um, a very nice example is silicon. Uh, so the, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, two sets of spectra um, for uh, silicon, a silicon wafer with native oxide on top. Uh, and we see between the silicon zero and the silicon four plus and the silicon oxide, we see a binding energy shift of four electron volts. It's a 2p state, therefore we see the spin orbit splitting here. Uh, this here, the, um, uh, the peaks are broader, that's why we can't resolve the spin orbit splitting. What we uh, can see in those spectra in addition is a very nice and useful effect uh, or property of, of uh, photoelectrons. And that is um, the high surface sensitivity due to low pen penetration or information depth of photoelectrons. The top spectrum has been recorded at grazing emission. That means the photoelectrons travel of, of the silicon uh, uh, zero travel a longer distance through the silicon oxide as seen here compared to normal emission, which is the bottom spectrum. As a consequence, these electrons are less attenuated, uh, uh, are more attenuated by the silicon oxide than these electrons. And therefore, um, the relative height of the silicon zero compared to the silicon oxide is greater for normal emission than for grazing emission. That's a very important property. So we are very, very surface sensitive with XPS. We're coming back to chemical shifts, another important application of chemical shifts is in organic molecules. Um, the carbon 1s binding energy depends on the functional group um, 
that uh, is attached to the uh, carbon atom. And again, the rule of thumb here is the higher the electronegativity of the side group, the higher the binding energy. So an electronegative side group pulls electrons away from the carbon. We have less repulsion within the carbon atom between uh, electrons within the carbon atom and therefore a higher binding energy. And we see, we have a series here. So CH, CC is typically the lowest binding energy. Then we have CN, CO, carbon uh, chlorine, carbon fluorine and uh, CO double bonds uh, are very high in, in binding energies. A nice example uh, is shown at the uh, bottom left here, that's ethyl trifluoroacetate. So we have a carbon atom in contact with three fluorine atoms with the highest binding energy, then we have carbon oxygen, uh, carbon in contact with two oxygens, a carbon in contact with one oxygen, and a carbon only in contact with uh, carbon hydrogen and carbon and, and another carbon atom at the lowest binding energy. Another um, uh, example from our own work is, is this uh, uh, amino acid alanine here. Alanine has three different carbon atoms, uh, one uh, only with carbon hydrogen and carbon carbon bonds. Then we have a carbon nitrogen bond and with a carbon with two oxygen bonds and they can be uh, resolved as three uh, different peaks in the carbon spectrum here. Um, these chemical shifts can also be modeled uh, with a modern DFT codes. And uh, this is an example here where we collaborated with Ricardo Grau Crespo from Reading University. Um, this is the adsorption of methyl acetoacetate on nickel 111 and DFT gave almost the same adsorption energy for uh, this um, uh, bidentate uh, structure at, at the uh, bottom here and this flat enol uh, structure at the top here. Uh, but what DFT can also do is uh, calculate the uh, chemical shifts in XPS, and this is for the O1s uh, uh, photoelectrons. And we see in the, the three oxygen atoms involved for the flat enol uh, have two high binding energy peaks and one low binding energy peak, whereas the bidentate enolate has one high binding energy peak and two low binding energy peaks. If you use those and compare with the experimental data, uh, that, that's the blue line here, we see the uh, enolate, the bidentate enolate has a much better agreement with theory than the flat enol. And so by combining DFT and uh, XPS, we can clearly identify one adsorption geometry over the other. There's another uh, example where adsorption geometry uh, changes and has a market effect in, in XPS. This is another amino acid serine on a somewhat complicated chiral copper surface, 531. And here we have um, two configurations. One where this oxygen atom is detached from the surface and that leads to uh, a clear peak here at 533 electron volts. If this oxygen atom makes a bond with the uh, substrate as on the right, uh, this peak moves from high binding energy to much lower binding energy here around 530.5 electron volts. So the, the latter example was already recorded at uh, a synchrotron and now in the remaining five minutes or so, I would like to take you through a few uh, examples of um, a, a, a work done at synchrotron. The big advantage of uh, synchrotrons is the tunable energy. 
Um, we can tune the uh, X-ray energy such that we have uh, the highest possible or the highest useful um, uh, cross section. And that means we can uh, record data much faster and uh, with much better intensity. Um, this is illustrated in uh, the diagram at, at the right here. So we have uh, the uh, cross section of the carbon 1s electron here. And um, a typical uh, X ray anode experiment would be done at 1240 or 1400 electron volt with magnesium K alpha or aluminium K alpha uh, sources. Um, when we tune the photon energy to 400 EV, we get about an order of magnitude higher cross section. That means we can reduce the time it takes to measure the spectrum by a factor 10, not even regarding the higher uh, intensity that we get from the synchrotron. We get much better energy resolution than with X-ray anodes. And so the combination of all that means that we can measure very fast spectra, we can measure very accurate spectra. Uh, one example is we can, for instance, resolve so-called surface core level shifts. So surface atoms are in an electronically different environment from bulk atoms. There is a different valence electron distribution uh, because there are fewer na uh, neighboring atoms. We can have adsorbates on the surface which interact with um, the um, um, uh, the, the surface atoms. And all that gives rise to small uh, chemical shifts of the order of less than one electron volt. And here's a nice um, example of a ruthenium surface. Um, down here, uh, we have um, a peak of the bulk atoms, a peak of the second layer below the surface and a peak of the atoms at the surface. If we then expose this surface to oxygen, we can clearly make out extra peaks due to ruthenium atoms in contact with one oxygen, in contact with two oxygens, in contact with three oxygens. Um, and then if the surface was oxidized, we would even see a different uh, shift on that. So very detailed information about uh, the um, bond coordination at surfaces. Another uh, useful uh, application of synchrotrons is the, the, the fact that we can measure fast spectra and that allows us to measure a, a, a fast series of XPS spectra while we're heating the sample, for instance. And this is again alanine on two different nickel surfaces here. Uh, we measure spectra, they typically take about half a minute and, and each spectrum and we slowly measure, um, uh, slowly anneal the surface. And uh, what we get is these false color um, uh, diagrams where the, the, the color corresponds to the intensity. Here we have the binding energy and the y-axis is the temperature. And just to illustrate for those two different surfaces, uh, we see decomposition of the alanine molecule here around 350 um, uh, Kelvin. Uh, but after decomposition, we see two very different chemical behaviors for the two surfaces. So the decomposition um, products are very different depending on which surface the decomposition takes place. And the final section, uh, can, I appreciate it's almost two o'clock, but can I can I carry on for another five minutes or so? Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the final section, I I, I just really want to uh, say a little bit about the work I do at at Diamond Light Source. Um, uh, is about near ambient pressure XPS. So obviously, these all these experiments that I've been talking about so far, whether synchrotron or non-synchrotron, uh, took place in, in, in vacuum because 
you need vacuum to allow the electrons to travel from the surface, from the sample to the analyzer. Now, um, it has been the dream of, of people working in the field of catalysis or related fields like battery uh, and so on to also carry out these experiments under uh, ambient conditions, under um, uh, realistic conditions where we have, for instance, a, a catalyst uh, exposed to a reactive gas environment. And the problem there is that both the X-rays as well as the electrons are uh, attenuated by the gas phase. And this is given by the formula down here. So it's a, a bare lumbered law. Um, and essentially we have the pressure entering in this uh, 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 exponential function. So the, uh, the uh, attenuation is, depends exponentially on the pressure that uh, the electrons and x-rays have to go through. In practice, that means we can get electrons through a gas phase length of about a millimeter uh, or less if we, um, if the pressure is uh, at around a millibar. But a millibar is already far closer to realistic conditions than the 10 to minus nine millibars that we usually have in a vacuum chamber. So um, near ambient pressure setups have been developed over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, one of them at Diamond, and that's our beamline BO7. And so the, the, at the heart of the beamline, we have uh, a differentially pumped beamline entrance. So that allows us to have a good vacuum in the synchrotron of 10 to minus nine millibar. Uh, but still uh, go up to pressures of around 100 millibar in the sample uh, environment. And this is done by having a small aperture here and then a series of big pumps uh, in that section here that uh, pump away all the gas that makes it through that small aperture. Same principle is applied in the analyzer. So here we have the hemisphere of the analyzer and along here, we have a series of small apertures. The smallest here, right by the sample, is 0.3 millimeters, the same as for the beamline entrance. And then we have, again, a big pump here and two more big pumps. And, and, and between the different pumping stations, we have small apertures. So we limit the amount of gas that can get into the detector. And so essentially the electrons move freely without attenuation of gas once they pass the first aperture. And if we now bring the sample uh, close to this first aperture and get the X-rays in between the sample and the aperture, we can measure um, uh, XPS up to pressures of about 30 millibars. So this shows the attenuation of a gold for F spectrum. This is what we get at, uh, under vacuum conditions. And down here is what we get at 30 millibar. So up to 10 millibar, we can still measure comfortably a, a, a nice signal. Uh, we can just about go to 30 millibar that reduces the signal to uh, 2%. And just uh, to finish, um, I, I would like to show you two examples. Um, so uh, here is uh, that is a, a spectrum. The, the spectrum I'm showing is actually glycine, another uh, amino acid on copper. Again, temperature programmed XPS. One is under vacuum conditions, and this is under uh, 0.1 tor of water, so that's uh, roughly a tenth of a millibar water. We can already see at this relatively low water vapor pressure very big change in both the decomposition temperature, 415 Kelvin and around 500 Kelvin here. And also uh, we see a different decomposition product that we don't see in, in vacuum here. The other um, um, uh, example I want to show is again, alanine on 
uh, nickel surface that is uh, a system that's actually quite relevant for uh, enhanced selective catalysis where alanine is used as a car modifier. Um, under vacuum conditions, we, we can see from the spectra uh, a dominant nitrogen 1s peak here just under 400 EV binding energy. Now, if we expose that surface to uh, pressures of uh, hydrogen, again in the 10 to minus uh, one tor range, that changes and this new peak that we get here is indicative for an NH3 species rather than an NH2. So a very significant change that we wouldn't have discovered if we had done the experiments under vacuum conditions as it's the conventional way of doing XPS. Here's a, um, a series uh, of, of, of fields that um, ambient pressure XPS can be applied to. And I would just like to point out that a key pressure range is that of uh, vacuum uh, of the equilibrium vapor pressure of water, which is around 30 millibar at room temperature. If and when we can get to this range, and we do already, as I, as I showed you before, then we can really look at uh, pharmaceuticals, biological systems in aqueous environments. We can look at atmospheric chemistry and obviously uh, heterogeneous catalysis covers a, a much bigger pressure range. But there are lots of interesting uh, applications for XPS if we can uh, expand the pressure range to a near ambient pressure conditions. Um, so let me summarize. So just a few uh, key points that I've discussed and a few take home messages. So XPS is a quantitative analysis method, it gives us the quantitative elemental composition. One can use chemical shifts to identify oxidation states, intramolecular bonding, adsorption sites, and so on. And that means it is not just elemental composition, it's actually a chemical composition of the surface that we get from XPS. It's a surface sensitive method and typical uh, information depth is a few nanometers up to about six nanometers. When we use synchrotrons, we get fast data acquisition and high resolution. And we can now, as of the last decade or so, uh, use XPS also in high pressure environments. And that allows us to study catalyst batteries and, and uh, environmental chemistry in a more realistic environment. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Georg. Uh, it's a really interesting talk. Uh, I see Sophia put on the, the clap emoji. I'm, oh, it takes me a while to work out how I uh, I do that. Um, yeah, I'm never quite sure how to uh, how, how we ignore that. But thanks very much. Really interesting talk. Um, so yeah, I, I think now uh, uh, if people have uh, any questions. So as I said before, you can either turn on your your microphone uh, and and ask, or you can put them in the chat. Um, so yeah. Uh, Floor is open for uh, for questions. You, while people may, uh, may may tap away. Um, oh, we've got. Uh, no, someone's already beat me to it. So someone's got a question yet. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can yeah. hear. You. So, uh, Hello. I'm um, basically relatively new to the XPS, and I would like to know. Is there any way that we can just find, just from the XPS, the energy gap between the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital between HOM and LUMO? Right. Um, not with XPS, um, but uh, well, what you can do is uh, you can use a combination of XPS and X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Um, so the problem is uh, XPS by its very nature can only excite uh, 
electrons from occupied levels. You can only ex excite an, an electron if it's there. So you won't see the unoccupied levels. But you can use a, a, a method which is known as Nexus X-ray absorption spectroscopy or SANES, where you excite a core electron. And I am not sure that I can go back very quickly. So I, I, I basically need to go back to the uh, diagram that I had at the, very much at the very beginning. Uh, yeah, okay, here. So if I, if I use a photon energy, which is, um, um, lifts the electron up to an unoccupied state between the Fermi energy and the vacuum level, um, I can measure, uh, I, I will see a resonance and I will see an, an enhanced signal from the sample and by measuring the photon energy that I need to get from here to the resonance, I can determine the position of the uh, LUMO of the uh, uh, unoccupied levels. By measuring the uh, kinetic energy of the uh, uh, electrons that come from the um, energy levels just below the Fermi energy or of the con uh, 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 um, valence band in a, in a semiconductor, I, I can identify this position here. And by the combination of the two, I can actually measure the, the band gap. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay, are there, are there any other questions? I, I, I add one quick, if you have, um, so if you're measuring the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons, um, and you've got them from from two overlapping lines. So um, something you've got one that's being emitted from the carbon one s, and something that's simultaneously being emitted at the same energy from a um, a higher shell of a, a heavy element. I can't think of one that matches. Uh, um, is it possible to distinguish them? Well, um, there are. I'm I'm not aware of any two binding energies that are exactly the same. Okay. So, right. so it, it, it basically comes down to um, the resolution of the analyzer. Um, um, and I mean, one thing, yeah, it's, it, it, it basically comes down to the resolution, really. So what, what you sometimes have is uh, overlapping O'Shea uh, signals and, and photoelectrons. And that you can... Uh, you, you can shift the photoelectrons by using different photon energies. Um, that uh, is, is sometimes, so in particular at the synchrotron, it's very useful to, to, to have that capability. Okay, but there's, uh, there's no two lines that are sufficiently similar that you couldn't, I, you I'm, have a resolution you can't. I, I, I never come across uh, any. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that there, there, there aren't any, but I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any that, uh, uh, certainly in my experience, it has never happened. Are there any other questions either typed or turned on the microphone? Um, okay, so the question here, um, uh, could you, could you comment again on how you identify the nature of the chemical bond between the absorbate and the structure? Right. Um, so it's, so the, I must say that the, the, the most straightforward way is probably uh, by getting somebody to do DFT calculations for you. Uh, so, so um, everything, everything else is relatively hand waving, uh, but there are these. Um, basically, the rules of thumb that I uh, put out here is 
um, the binding energy changes as a function of the uh, valence electron density. So if an atom um, makes a bond with, with a metal substrate, it suddenly sees a whole sea of, 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 of electrons close by, and that will affect the, um, the uh, um, binding energy of, of that atom. And this is, for instance, what we see here. So we have an, an, an oxygen atom detached from a metal surface, uh, and that means it has a high binding energy. If it comes in close contact with the metal surface, it has a much lower binding energy. So the shift here is about two electron or more than two electron volts. Um, so it's, it's, it's that principle that you can usually apply. Um, and this is also confirmed when, when you uh, um, calculate chemical shifts with DFT. But obviously, DFT is far more accurate and can actually help you really identify and pin it down to a particular uh, uh, to a particular structure, as we've as we've done here in, in collaboration with Ricardo. Okay. Um, well, I mean, so there's a question that said um, uh, very recently uh, people have used photon energy dependent XPS to detect the dopant iron distribution in, in nanoparticles. Can you comment on the accuracy of this strategy? Um, can you repeat the question? Um, uh, recently, people have used photon energy dependent XPS to detect the dopant iron distribution in nanoparticles. Can you comment uh, um, about the accuracy of this strategy? Um, all right, okay. So um, I think what the question is referring to is um, is um, changing the photon energies and therefore change the kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectron. And in doing so, changing the penetration depth of the photon electron. So the penetration depth uh, is a function of energy for uh, small kinetic energies of around 100 electron volt, it is less than a nanometer. If you go to kinetic energies of around 1,000 electron volts, uh, you end up with three, four, five, six nanometers penetration or information depth. Um, and so if you change the photon energy, if, if, you, if you use a small photon energy, uh, um, and a small kinetic energy, that means you're extremely surface sensitive. If you use a higher photon energy, you see more of the bulk. And in doing so, you, you can create a profile of, of um, a do a dopant uh, concentration uh, surface versus bulk. I think this is what the question refers to. And that has been used uh, uh, quite successfully. Um, there are a number of caveats with that, uh, in particular if you look at very small nanoparticles. Remember we are talking about uh, one to six nanometers and that uh, uh, and, and if you go too far, if, if the penetration depth becomes too big, you, you already see the other side of the nanoparticle as well. So, uh, and, and so, uh, but it can be used and people are still developing that, uh, that method, but it's, it's a very useful uh, thing to do. Thank you very much. I, I, another question, does the work function vary um, um, uh, if studied in near ambient pressure experiments? Um, that's a very good question. And the answer is, um, so uh, is yes, uh, but um, I mean, I did not, um, uh, refer to that uh, or uh, 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 talk about that in, in great detail. It is actually the work function of the analyzer that we, um, th that we normally have to take into account. And um, 
analyzers are normally coated with an inert material. It's usually uh, graphite or gold uh, to prevent it from having changes in, in the work function. But it, it is a problem uh, uh, or it can be a problem in particular when you uh, have very aggressive gases that uh, yeah, mo modify the, the work function of the analyzer. Um, a question. Um, uh, in, for water absorption on oxide surfaces, is it possible to identify using XPS if the water is absorbed as a molecule or as an OH and an H? Oh, very much so, yeah. The, uh, the binding energy difference between OH and, and uh, molecular water is about one electron volt. Um, the, 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 bigger, the bigger problem is uh, when, when you look at an oxide, you obviously have a very large peak from the uh, oxide oxygen. Um, and to, if, if you only have small amounts of water absorbed on the oxide to, to, to discriminate the water signal from, from the oxide oxygen signal. But yes, it's, it's, uh, and it's standard, standard practice. So there, there, there's a lot of work uh, where that has been done. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. So I, I don't see any other questions. Um, so if, uh, if, if that's not the case, uh, uh, thank uh, Georg again for a really interesting talk. Thank you everyone for participating and asking questions. Um, the, the said the, um, so earlier in the, the chat, Faye put the website